You're listening to the Foreign and International Medical Graduate Show, a podcast to inspire physicians in the process of immigration to the United States and access to graduate medical education. We create meaningful and helpful content that motivates medical students and doctors throughout the world with the goal of creating a community that supports itself and gives feedback to each other, that stays updated with the most recent tips and advice on how to make it in America and become a successful resident or fellow in the speciality of your dreams. Dr. Alonso Osorio is board certified and residency trained in both emergency and family medicine and will be bringing you 20 years of his personal experiences, struggles and motivation. We'll be chatting with people like you to talk about the lessons they've learned along their personal path, how to make an impact and how we can all benefit from it. Also, we'll analyze the current resources available and how to benefit from them. Thanks for joining us. Please enjoy the show. Hey guys, I am back. I am back with Chase DiMarco. We've been having conversations probably for the last six months on trying to get together. And obviously, as I said before, I hate to give out excuses, but my excuse is kind of solid. I have gone through some personal difficulties of me moving in between states and starting a new job. And you guys probably soon will understand what, what that is like. And, and actually now residents are finally settled. They are 20 days into the residency training as interns and it's fantastic. So I got Chase DiMarco. Chase, welcome back. Tell us what's been up with your life since we talked last and what are you up to these days? <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Osorio. It is great to be back. I know last time we spoke was uh, at least a year ago on the show. Absolutely. That was about the Medical Nemonist podcast. So really going into learning and using mnemonics, creating mnemonics for your own studying and long-term retention. And, uh, you know, that's really one of the starting points for a lot of the material I've created since then have another podcast rounds to residency, which really focuses on that clinical education aspect. You know, what do you do after the lecture part, when you start doing your clinical rotations, what to expect, how to get letters of recommendation, all of those types of things, but really in the background, since I've been working on these shows, I have also been working on this platform called Find a Rotation, which is kind of where we're probably going to focus on today. And it's really what I call the quote unquote Airbnb of clinical rotations. It just uh, is something that was in great need before and even more so now with COVID. So I hope that we can maybe clarify some of the processes for your audience and see if this might be a good platform for them to use. Every day I get emails regarding that. And if I offer rotations myself or if I know of people offering rotations, and as you know, you've been working very close on, on, on researching this, this project since 2018, 2019. And finally, you came up with an amazing platform at findrotation.com. And we're going to talk about that. But 20 years ago, uh, when I came into the United States, I remember I had to pay about $100 per month, per rotation. And 20 years later, I heard that there are ridiculous prices as high as $3,000 plus a month. What do you think it happened there? Where that whole inflation of rotations, do you think, and I'm just going to ask you a second question here, or do you think they realize that there is a profit on this and they're taking advantage of us, specifically foreign medical grads in need for clinical exposure? It probably is a lot of both. I know that for my fourth year elective rotations, I ended up using a rotation agency for that. And that's where the idea for finding rotation came from because I was being charged about $1,000 a week for most of the rotations I purchased through that organization. And I didn't actually even get the last couple of them and there was no refund policy and it was just a horrible, horrible experience. I used a few other rotation agencies too. Even my school used them and a lot of Caribbean schools and foreign schools have to because they don't have necessarily the affiliates with hospitals and with other clinics for their students to go to. So they'll use these agencies and there were probably three or four, maybe five big names prior to COVID. And I think there's like 30 of them out now. <laughs> it's just exploded. And it's because there is such a huge demand. FMGs, IMGs, I use them interchangeably. I know we can nitpick about the difference in the terminology, but basically anyone that did 
that went to a school outside of the U.S. coming here. Uh, we make up, I believe the last number I saw was about 30, 35% of the U.S. physician workforce. That's significant. It's really high. And if you picture one third of medical students not having necessarily a hospital to go to or having limited rotations available to them, there's definitely a need there. So what agencies will do, and you could compare them to maybe a locum tenens agency, if you have any experience with that or any of your audience does, or even a real estate agent, uh, especially a few years ago, you would have to go through a real estate agent to find a rental place. And that was before Airbnb came along and really one of the many platforms that made it easier for not only the renter to list their property without having to use a third party agent and spending whatever money it is for their services, but also a central location for the renters to go to and find multiple locations, not just the ones available from this real estate agent or this brokerage, but worldwide everywhere. And that's basically what we modeled this idea with find a rotation after it's not an agency. We don't get in the middle of everything and charge these huge fees and keep most of whatever they're charging the student. Anyway, I think some of the numbers we ran through based on numbers from these agencies websites is they keep about a thousand, one third, I want to say, of what they charge the students. Some of them even more than that. But of the numbers that we could find publicly available, that means the student's paying, you know, 33% more than they normally would, or one third more, just to cover the agency's costs. So by providing this marketplace, this platform, just as a listing service of sorts, it allows any physician, hospital, administrator to go on, create their clinical site, put all the recommendations they want, what type of students, how many students, what their schedule is like, any documentation they require. And then the student and graduate can go on, search by price, by location, by specialty. And once they upload their documents to their profile, well, it's there. So they can just click submit for every new rotation instead of having to maybe print out all of these documents, send them in, fax them, email them to these different hospitals, and the process becomes so repetitive. So we've really tried to automate as much of that as possible as well to make it a single location that the students are getting transparent, affordable pricing for, and it makes it easier for any physicians, including non-academic physicians, to still be able to precept students because they might not have the ability to otherwise. Let me rewind a little bit, and I want to get a little bit basic on this because I have two types of listeners, the ones that are like sitting around and realizing that they are thinking about coming into the United States. And the question that I would have if I have never come, I would say, what is a clinical rotation in the United States and why me as a medical student or doctor already trained, do I need to shadow or do an observership? And, and what is the difference in between clerkship, observership, contact or contactless or patient exposure or not? Let's go about the basics. <laughs> Sure. And it is very confusing because there are a lot of different terms used for the same thing. But as a comparison, if you are a U.S. student, for instance, you are traditionally going to have four years of medical school. Two of them were traditionally in the lecture hall, in the classroom setting. And two of them were then following a physician around in the hospital, in the clinic, getting the hands-on experience of patient care so that they can assess your ability to actually practice as a physician to the quality necessary to apply for residency. Now, things are a lot more integrated where some schools will have students start earlier on or mix the lecture and the clinical rotations aspect. But for those of us that went to smaller schools or newer schools or foreign schools, we typically will do the lecture part at the home base on that island or in that country, and then come back to the U.S. to do our clinical aspect afterwards. And clinical rotations in the way that I'm using the term really includes any kind of clinical experience. This okay. can be clerkships, 
which are also known as externships with slight difference, depending on who you talk to. It's kind of like IMG, FMG. <laughs> it's just the terminology, but really it's the same thing. Those typically include hands-on experience where you actually do get to go in, speak to the patient, maybe run physical exams. You can do a certain procedural things depending on where you're at, where an observership or shadowing are the hands-off experiences. You might be able to follow a physician around, but you don't have direct contact, like hands-on contact with a patient. You're not allowed to do procedures. You're not allowed to do as much of that hands-on part of the clinical experience. So if you're coming from a foreign school and maybe you've already graduated, maybe you are a physician in another school uh, in another mm -hmm. country, well, still to apply for residency, there are certain steps you have to take, as I'm sure you're aware. And one of those is they want to make sure that you might have the hands-on experience and training from your country, but the U.S. healthcare yeah. system is a bit different. And they want to make sure you gain that experience and get recommendations from your preceptors. So when you apply for residency here, you have some sort of larger aspect experience to the local system and which may or may not be vastly different from your home country. Sometimes it's remarkably different. And I'm going to tell you my personal experience. I, I, I talk in the intro of the podcast that this is experiential, not only mine, but someone else's experience. But in summary, for me, it was crucial to come here and get that exposure. And I think final rotation is going to make this so much easier. But in general, I found a one-stop shop for me was the University of Miami through the William J. Harrington's uh, training programs for Latin America and the Caribbean. And it, it worked out just fine. But you come with all this uh, clinical knowledge in Colombia, for in my case, or India or Russia or Japan or China, Australia. And suddenly you find yourself seeing the Americans writing the history of present illness, the past medical history in such a different way, the physical exam structures, for the most part, the same, but the assessment, the plan, the diagnostic impressions, all these things that you see them writing like, oh my God, it is so different to the way we do it. It is so complex. Why do we do it this way? Oh, it has billion implications. If you don't document properly, you don't get paid, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, well, that's interesting to know. And also how they introduce themselves to the patients, how empowered the patients are about interacting with the doctors. You know, it's not that paternalistic attitude that we have in third world countries of you tell the patient and you just do or you just tell him shut up and do it here. American patients soon will let you know you're a bad doctor, your bedside manner sucks and they literally fire you. So all those little nuances for me were, were radical. And I had hands off rotations. I had no hands on rotations. Mine were 100 percent observations and you get got seriously punished if you actually we're interacting with a patient because there is some sort of a liability component into that. So mm -hmm. it is a vast difference. So let's talk about that. Are you going to be able to offer both observerships for the ones like me that came to this country and we cannot lay hands on the patients? And are you going to have the availability of ha having the hands-on type of rotations for the international medical graduates, the American citizens that went overseas for medical school and are returning into the U.S.? Or can, can even a local medical student use the platform? Yeah. So the simple answer there would be yes. <laughs> the complex answer is, and it's funny that you use Florida as an example, because that's actually a state that I was trying to receive some clinical rotations in back in my third, fourth year. And they had a law at the point, which has sen since been revoked, that you could only attend two different rotations if you were from a school outside of the state. And wow. a lot of states have these little nuanced rules. Nevada has, New York has, Florida has. A lot of the southern states are more restrictive to IMGs than northern states might be. But there are various little differences to each state, and these laws are constantly changing. So, the answer is yes, we can provide those, but it will depend on what the laws are in the state at the time. I believe Nevada right now actually is one of those states that will allow IMGs, FMGs to do observerships, but not hands-on. And that's only in the past couple of years, I believe, not knowing the whole legal history of Nevada medical law, but after they came out with the new UNLV teaching a medical school, I should say, then they were a little more restrictive. And again, a lot of these 
laws and rules change every couple of years. So we are working on a, a blog post, a document that students can go to for these changes and hopefully try to keep them updated as much as possible. I think we have maybe eight or 10 of the most asked about states, their laws listed there and try to decipher it as much as our non-legal advice minds can do so. But we will be providing all of these different rotations have currently maybe, I want to say getting close to a hundred physicians that are interested in joining the new program wow. too. Because our beta testing app had a lot of flaws, we have been working on a completely new version that should be out in the next couple of weeks. And then we'll be onboarding these new physicians. And hopefully a lot of those will provide the experiences for all of the, the different IMGs, FMGs that may need different rotations, different qualities, different uh, price ranges, different specialties. I want to really thank you for actually taking the, uh, it's, I think it's an innovative idea. Maybe someone thought about it before. I think might revolutionize the market and probably many people are feeling threatened by it. I don't know if you are getting a lot of hate email as of now or phone calls of people that are potentially thinking that this will potentially fly and they want to shut you down or how that process is going, because I think it's going to be phenomenal. Finalrotation.com is going to be, I think, the, the place to go to. Yeah. Luckily, we're not big enough to be getting the hate mail yet, but that probably will happen. Most physicians that I've discussed this idea with think it's great. And they really wish there's something like that when they were going through medical school. Even if you are a U.S. student, because I failed to really answer that part of your last question, you can still use this. The only other system that I'm aware of that's even close would be the VSAS or VSLO, which is run by the AMA. And I've spoken to dozens of, phys dozens of physicians that did not really, no one had a good thing to say about the system. It was kind of clunky. It was hard to navigate. A lot of the information was outdated because it's up to the schools to, I guess, update their page, which is probably low on their list of priorities. Whatever their reason may be, they didn't really like that system. So U.S. students can still use this too and find other rotations outside of what their school might allow. And we think that that hopefully will actually decrease some of the burnout and transitioning or changing your degrees interesting study came across a few months ago is that about 20 to 25 percent of residents and physicians change careers they change specialties so if you do that well you're likely to receive not only an extended period of training because you have to start over in the new specialty but you know that decreased pay for the extra year or two is going to affect you it decreases the opportunity for you to have that extra year or two take on patients yourself and just all of these factors. If you have more opportunities and you can gain that, let's use emergency medicine as a, mm -hmm. an example. I wanted to take an emergency medicine rotation, but they didn't have it available in any of the places I went to. So that's an experience that maybe I'd be a good fit for, but I'll never know because I didn't receive the hands-on experience in that setting. Giving all of these other students and graduates the opportunity to try out more rotations, more specialties will hopefully give them a better idea before they just apply to a residency because they heard this from a friend or, you know, because they want this type of life, but they didn't actually get to experience it during their education. Well, Chase, F-A-R, final rotation, I think is going to completely change the landscape of finding a rotation for anyone across the United States. What are the barriers that you found yourself going through when trying to set up this system and just the whole project? I know that you and I have spoken about the time and financial investment that you have had on developing the website, doing the connections, developing the application, et cetera. Tell us about what was the process like, what it has been like, and what are you looking forward to? Sure. Well, the idea and the first real steps began in 2019, shortly after my bad experiences with my rotations. And that was what led me to believe, all right, there's got to be a better way to do this. I think these agencies are a bit predatory. They're not really having the students or physicians best interest at heart. It's all about, you know, it seemed to me that it was all about what their cut is, what they're making. 
So I started investigating app development, had some friends that were going through this company, didn't know how to vet a company properly at the time, started using that one. And basically they said, it's going to be X amount and take three months to create. By the end of 2019, a year later, it still was garbage and they still were missing a lot of features <laughs> that we had initially discussed. So 2020 came around, started with a new company and they were much better their programming skills was much higher. And I did have a consultant that was helping with some of the translations, uh, just talking to someone with a engineering background with programming knowledge. It's very different than communicating your idea more artistically. <laughs> one's yeah. a little artistic, one's a little finite. So we used that product as the beta testing version, which uh, we completed beta testing in the beginning of this year, 2021 now. And it still wasn't quite what I felt comfortable with as an MVP or minimum viable product. Your first okay. release, you really want to do as bare bones as possible to get the idea out and get feedback, which I felt we did with the last version, but it's not one I really necessarily felt comfortable sending out to medical professionals and learners. If it doesn't have the right aesthetic, the right look, if it looks like it was made on Windows 95, for instance, which this was way better than that, but you're going to receive some negative feedback from it and people not wanting to come back to use the platform. So I started again earlier this year with a new company, the third one, and this one is very well put together from what I've seen so far. We had to take the design all the way back to specs, all the way back to the beginning, make new wireframes, new designs, new programming. It's really a completely new app and it looks really good so far. And we have a lot of more of the features I wanted in it. We have referral codes too. So any student or physician that refers others to it can also earn different rewards for for doing that. And we only have a small transaction fee that is attached to using the platform. So all the rest of the money, whatever it says as the uh, price is going straight to the preceptor. So without that, you know, 30, 40% uh, increase, yeah, then the physicians get a higher percentage and hopefully they keep it more affordable for the students too. So again, it's just more affordability, more transparency, more opportunities for both sides. And we just try to connect them in a way that's easy for both parties, both the uh, student and learner side and the professional or preceptor side. Yeah, I see the website that you have actually resources for preceptors, some ar articles on uh, for the preceptors and some basics on guides to for teaching clinical skills to medical students, which I found find rather awesome. And the website is self-explanatory. Every single, what we call FAQ, frequently asked question, it will be broken down and it is easily, easily accessible. So if you want to really go to findarotation.com, that easy, findarotation.com, start searching, start looking right now because Within the next few months, this is going to be live or are we, what's the timeline? Yeah, the hope is within the next few weeks, it'll be live. We are revamping the whole website. So if you go now, it's going to be much improved very soon. It's going to have more extensive FAQ section, video tutorials, all kinds of new information, good information for all the users to really benefit from it the most, have a new onboarding sequence that we're working on. And yeah, it should be hopefully live by maybe, we'll just say August for now. Uh, we're hoping the end of July, but these things always end up taking longer than planned. Chase, I have a, a curiosity here running in the back of my head. How a medical student becomes such a businessman and such a technology geek and <laughs> uh, an entrepreneur that is trying to revolutionize the way uh, any student finds a rotation in the United States. I mean, it's crazy. You have rounds to residency. You have the Medical Nemonist podcast. You know, you, you're wrapping up medical school. You're moving also from Florida to Vegas, trying to get things done. What's up with you? Where all this energy comes from? I guess it depends how far back you want to go, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've, I've always- what, what, was had... your, what was your undergrad on? 
biology and psychology. I dual majored. Yeah. I always liked the aspect of learning how to learn and just how the mind works and how the body works. So I kind of went both for psych and for bio and that really probably influenced a lot of my decisions later on. And also just being critical, hopefully not overly critical of a lot of the institutions I've used in the past. Um, Like there are better ways to do this. If somebody just has the resources to do so or cares enough to do so. I don't have the resources necessarily, which is why it's also taking a lot longer, but I do have the passion for it. So I'm hoping that uh, we get to a final version pretty soon. And, you know, anything that can break down what I would hope others agree are kind of arbitrary boundaries and giving more opportunities to a wider group of, of individuals and learners, I think is a good thing. So future doctor, entrepreneur, a podcaster and uh, uh, author, right? Because mm-hmm. you have that the book called Read This Before Medical School, correct? Correct. Yes. Uh, yeah, I guess I just like to try new things out and <laughs> create content and hope other people enjoy it. <laughs> Where can we find the book, by the way? I, uh, re- I read it. It was really nice. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, you can definitely find it on Amazon and pretty much any online bookstore, I believe, should still have it forget if it's Barnes and Nobles, it's still around. Yeah. I think Borders is the one that closed, but if you search at any online bookstore, it should be there. Hey buddy. And um, right now, obviously so many people are freaking out. I mean, there has been so many changes. They canceled the step two clinical skills, obviously for the same issue. So I bet you get asked two questions. Hey Chase, what's up with COVID and rotations? Some most programs shut it down and they're getting back up and running? Are they going to go live? Are they going to be, you know, to be in person? Are they going to be virtual? What are going to be the barriers for the future of us immigrants ourselves on on breaking these these huge barriers? Yeah, I think these barriers are also constantly shifting, kind of like the state by state laws. So it's hard to say like one overgeneralization. I know from a lot of the physicians I've spoken to in states all over the country, some of them started allowing students back into the hospital after a couple of weeks. Some still are not allowing any students into the hospitals. So it does come back to those local laws, those local jurisdictions and just what they're following. But there are a lot of virtual rotations and that's definitely blown up as one of the main sources for IMGs over the past year or so, year and a half, and also something that we'll be able to offer on Finder Rotation. So hopefully, no matter what the political climate or the environmental or infectious disease um, health climate is, we should be able to provide some resource that will uh, benefit everyone. Awesome. And I'm going to throw you a curveball here. Ready? (laughs) All right. Coming in. So there is... (laughs) Two things that I had in my thought process when I came to the U.S. One, find the rotation. Okay, I found the rotation. Two, find it with reputable institution where you have reputable attending physicians or community doctors, private practice rotations. And why I'm saying that you do obviously a rotation, the doctor has a thought about how you perform during that month, and that guarantees you, for the most part, uh, letters of recommendations after committing yourself for four weeks. Hey, doc, can you write out, do you feel comfortable writing a letter of recommendation on my behalf? And, you know, Peter Martinez in Kendall in Miami, he's writing you a letter of recommendation, obviously won't have the same weight as uh the chief of cardiology of Jackson Memorial Hospital, mm-hmm. University of Miami, senior professor of medicine and cardiology. Are you going to have the capacity to also have access to big teaching institutions or how is it going to work? Great question. Yeah, that's um, that's definitely a tricky complicated answer. So I'll try to sum it up as (laughs) simply as possible. Over the past two years that I've really been working on this project and networking with dozens, hundreds of physicians throughout the US in all different specialties and clinical settings, those that are the most likely to be interested in something like this for themselves are those in the community. 
because they don't have the academic resources to necessarily find the students, to schedule with them, to work out payment plans. And a lot of them don't feel comfortable charging uh, students either. So hopefully we'll have the, the largest group of free rotations available. But we are um, discussing with several different both schools, uh, especially Caribbean schools, and with larger hospitals to gain more access. Of course, since the rotation platform is relatively new as far as the, the new version of it not being launched yet, it's probably going to take a little bit of time before we can get into some of the larger hospitals. We're going to have to build up that reputation. We're going to have to build some networks within these, but it's definitely a goal. It's on the horizon, and hopefully sooner rather than later, we will have those two. And if students do have any questions about these different clinical settings or asking for letters of recommendation or any of those types of topics. We have quite a few pretty detailed blog posts on Finder Rotation as well covering these topics. So that might be a good starting place to, to research that. And then if they have any further questions, they can type it in the chat box or email or find us on social media. It's at Finder Rotation on every platform. And uh, yeah, reach out with your questions and that really helps us too to redefine, all right, what should we add to the FAQ page? What new blog post should we come out with? What new research should we do to provide those bits of information and direction for the audience? This is beautiful. So one last thing that you want to tell anyone out there about finalrotation.com and how to get a hold of you and what to do and what are the steps to follow or is, is it self-explanatory or what do you tell us? Well, uh, we've definitely mentioned the website a few times and it's on all social media accounts if you type in Find a Rotation. So you can definitely reach out any way through those resources, find out more information. Of course, there's going to be a lot more coming out in the next couple of weeks when we revamp the website again with the new web app. <laughs> but I would just like to say it, anyone out there, whether you're a physician, a graduate, a current student, uh, do reach out with your questions, with your thoughts, uh, let's build this network, let's work together to make it more efficient, more affordable. And if we all you know, combine our resources, that's really what this platform is. It's crowdsourcing the resources that aren't currently being tapped into. So if we work together, we can make things much better, much stronger, much more efficient, and much more affordable. Amazing. Amazing. Well, Chase, it's been a pleasure again. Thank you for taking the valuable time of your life to spend it with me tonight. We struggle always to schedule because in between <laughs> the central standard time and the, what are you, mountain standard I'm time? Pacific now, but yeah, we were both Eastern the last time we spoke and now we're going back and forth different time zones, but... <laughs> Well, guys, a few words of encouragement for those that have not begun yet the pathway of getting their rotations in the United States. Please go search for finalrotation.com and just read. There is easy access. I'm going through it right now. It talks about Chase and his background as an MD, PhD, Master Science and MBA. Oh, my God, Lord Jesus, you have so many degrees. Amazing. <laughs> so, and you're going to be getting in touch with Chase himself. This is the, one of the, the, the perks also, because you know that as he grows, he will continue to be the guy on top and he will be looking for you guys. So Chase is going to be the, the person to go to through his new platform. Support him. Check it out. Pass it around. Remember, not many people know how to get a rotation in the United States. This website tells you everything you need to know on how to get started. And without hesitation, I completely support him. I have no financial benefits coming from Chase. This is a relationship that we have had now for more than a year and a half. And why not? Let's continue to support people that are trying to advocate not only for international medical graduates, but for us, for medical graduates. And, and I think you're doing a fantastic job. As always, I want to congratulate you. I know that this goes unrecognized. The long hours, the tears, the pain, the financial overhead that you have had on this, is it won't go unnoticed. And people like you are the ones that eventually we'll just break through and be successful no matter what. Thank you so much for your kind words. I hope so. And uh, I'm glad to be back here and speaking to your audience again. It's a great show that I fully endorse. Guys, 
as I said, uh, no excuses. I'm going to try to produce some strong material before the end of the month, put some good content out there, try to get it into my platforms again, into my, my page. I know some of you guys are reaching out to me to have discussions about mentorship. And uh, I'm, I've been remarkably overwhelmed with the amount of people reaching out. My inbox is full. I'm going to get back to each and one of you. I hope to get back to you on time. Please realize that I'm still a full-time uh, working attending physician and it's my wife and, and family <laughs> is always my little kids asking a piece of me and to try to keep that life work balance. You know, I'm trying to keep the wife happy because how do they say it in America? Happy wife, happy life, happy life. <laughs> and with that, I say goodbye, Chase. Thank you again. Thank you. Take care, Dr. Osorio. It's been awesome. God bless you all.